The development of this podcast was sponsored by Alexian Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. The viewpoints expressed are those of the person speaking and not of Alexian. Welcome to NMOSD Your Way Global, an educational podcast series for NMOSD patients worldwide. NMOSD stands for Neuromyelitis Optica Spectrum Disorder a rare relapsing autoimmune disorder of the central nervous system which primarily affects the optic nerves and the spinal cord. Your podcast hosts Lelania Lloyd and Debbie Latik, who have both lived with NMOSD for over 10 years, will be bringing their respective Canadian and Australian perspectives to the table in order to help patients worldwide better understand NMOSD. Over the next 16 episodes, clinicians, researchers, and fellow patients will come together to have important conversations about how to live your best life within your diagnosis. They will be offering up encouragement and practical tips for overall health and well-being. In this episode, Lelania talks with Samira Ahmed, an NMO patient and founder of the Samira Foundation. She shares what it was like to be newly diagnosed the way in which her life changed and how that inspired her to create a foundation to help others facing this life-altering disease. So let's get started. I wanted to talk to you today about what it was like when you were newly diagnosed with neuromyelitis optica. Can you describe what that time was like in your life and how old you were? I was 24 years old, about to turn 25 when I first noticed that there was this black circle, as I described it, in my right eye. And it started as a very small dot, but over a period of four days, kept growing and growing to the point where it overwhelmed my entire right eye to the point where I couldn't see. And thankfully I worked in ophthalmology. So I remember going into work, just this was I think a couple of days before the 4th of July in 2014. And I, I said to one of the fellows um, who I was working with, I said, you know, I'm having some trouble seeing out of my right eye. It looks like there's just this big black cloud that's getting in the way of seeing anything out of that eye. So we did my first of God knows how many visual fields at that point. That was the first time I ever did it. And mm-hmm. the visual field test showed that there was significant deficit in my right eye. So that sort of, you know, perpetuated a few questions and the doctors whom I worked with were nice enough to do a full workup. They checked everything structurally on my eye. Nothing was wrong. They checked the corneas, my retinas and um, checking for glaucoma and all kinds of things, the full workup. And they couldn't see anything, but they could definitely see that I, I was unable to see, which is when I got my first MRI and that MRI was kind of the beginning of everything. That MRI came back showing significant inflammation in the right optic nerve and the chiasm. So that was all how it started. And then I went into the hospital, was admitted for three days, got three days of IV steroids. When I was discharged, the doctor said that uh, it was an idiopathic case of optic neuritis with just a 16% chance of developing MS and that I should move on with my life because my vision would likely return within three months to a year. Wow. So that's what I did. <laughs> I tried to move and on, except three weeks later, not only did it not get better, but it, it got worse. And that's when, you know, the situation really got very serious. And I had my first lumbar puncture, a whole set of MRIs. And then it was determined that I had seronegative neuromyelitis optica. And that happened two weeks after my 25th birthday. Wow. That's a lot to deal with at 25. Yeah, it was, you know, in hindsight, the beginning days felt kind of like a blur. I don't remember them, but I remember them. It's very weird, but it wasn't until I heard what they diagnosed me with when it really hit me that something was wrong. And when it finally sunk in that this was a really serious disease, what kind of questions did you have about NMO and what it meant for your life? I mean, the first question was neuromyelitis. What, what is this? 
I've never heard of it. You know, what is this? What does this mean? Is this cancer? Am I going to die? How am I going to just keep losing vision? Am I going to end up in a wheelchair? Like every question I possibly could ask, I definitely asked. And, you know, I think the doctors tried their best to answer knowing that every situation was so different and to make matters a little more hairy. I was zero negative. My drug test came back negative. So, you know, there were a lot of questions. I felt like there were a lot of unanswered questions, but that's when I went to the internet. (laughs) I was going to ask you how you, how you went about getting the answers that you needed and what your sources were. Yeah. So it was during my quest to find answers on the, the, big bad internet when I realized that, wow, there's a lot of information that I'm looking for that's not very patient friendly, or there's just not a lot of information period. You know, I'm sure a lot of NMO patients can relate, especially from years ago. One of the first things that you saw at that time, Googling NMO was you have five years to live. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I saw that too. And I I said, oh my gosh, five years, that means I'm not even going to make it to 30. That was devastating. And it was actually unacceptable to me. You know, it is really scary, but like, where else are you supposed to go for information at that point? Right. Exactly. And And how did you go about breaking the news of your diagnosis to your friends and your loved ones? Like, how did people react to that? I have to say that I have been so fortunate throughout this entire ordeal that I've had really amazing support, whether it's from my family or my friends, but also the NMO community who I got to meet through my diagnosis and my advocacy work. I have never felt alone in this journey. Of course, there are times where you feel so isolated because no one really understands what you're going through but you. Mm-hmm. People can be there for you, but you know, you live in your body, you feel the things you feel, the thoughts, the emotions, the side effects of treatments and diagnostics and all that kind of stuff. You know, managing your health is a full time job in and of itself, Lelania. You know that better than anybody else. But explaining it, I remember in the beginning days was a little bit hard because I was still trying to understand it and explaining something that was so new and not to mention very complex at 25 felt like a big lift for me. The thing that I did actually, it's so crazy to think back at those beginning days. I wrote on my blog, I had a lifestyle blog that I started in college and everybody had been asking me, Samira, what happened? What happened? You know, we saw you were in the hospital. And so I wrote about it in my blog, instead of individually texting people and messaging them and whatever, I wrote about what had happened to me. I tried to explain it in the most lay person's way that I at that time knew how. And overnight, that post got somewhere around 15,000 views. And that's sort of when I had this aha moment, Lelania, where I said, wow, People are not only interested in my story, they're interested in learning about NMO. And furthermore, they're interested in helping NMO. And this light bulb went out for me where I said, you know what? I think I'm going to take matters into my own hands and see what I can do about this. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting when you put yourself out there on the internet, who responds and, and like, I don't know about you, but I like, do you find that it's when you're writing about your experience, that 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 process of writing the actual experience down kind of helps you process it? A hundred and ten percent. I know that's not a real percentage number, but you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Lelania, what I have learned through my personal journey with NMO, but also in my advocacy work with NMO and other, you know, rare diseases is that storytelling is one of the most powerful tools in our arsenal. Storytelling is great, of course, for the storyteller. It's cathartic, you know, getting that, those memories and those emotions, writing it down on paper. There's such, it's such a beautiful process, actually, sometimes painful, but I think it's necessary in certain situations. It was very necessary for me. It was a way for me to cope with it. But I think also, 
when other people who are going through something similar read stories, they feel this sense of solidarity. And that bond and that connection with a complete stranger goes such a long way when you're living with a rare incurable disease that nobody really knows about around you. Yeah, definitely. Storytelling is our most powerful tool in our community, you know, just trying to connect, you know, people who are newly diagnosed with people who have experience, you know, you put yourself out there on the internet, and it's amazing who finds you, you know, people from all over the world that think they're the only one with this disease. And, you know, they're scared, and they have questions. And, you know, your doctor can tell you whatever they want, from a medical point of view, you, but it's completely different to hear it from a peer, somebody who's walked in those shoes, even if it's not the exact same journey. um, Just, you know, the whole overall experience of, of sitting there and having the shock of that, that diagnosis wash over you. And then, and then you're sitting there going like, what does this mean for my life? And how do I move forward? And can I move forward? Like, you know, there's a grieving process that happens. Do you feel like, you know, you had a grieving process within the first year of getting that diagnosis? In fact, I could tell you um, with full conviction, seven years later, I'm still grieving. You know, I've had so many life since getting diagnosed of them being the foundation is really, I mean, I look at it kind of like my kid and I've had so many wonderful experiences in my career and travel and all of those things, despite living with NMO, but yeah, I'm still grieving. I'm grieving who I was supposed to be before all of this. I explain to people, everyone's always like, Samira, you look so good. Like, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, that's great. But I feel like I'm 95. Yeah, my body feels broken all the time. Everything feels so much harder. I just make it look a little easy, maybe. Yeah. And I mean, that's totally normal, right? I mean, we grieve ongoing in with this disease, because every time we lose a piece of ourselves that meant something, the ability to do something or, you know, just any little thing, you know, we grieve it all over again. And it's an ongoing process because our bodies, the state of our health is not static, right? It's always changing. And we're always having to adapt and overcome and cope. And it, you know, I always say like the first year, you're kind of figuring out what that diagnosis means to you. And in, in, and then after the first year, you decide how much space you're going to allow it right? Because you can't let it take over your whole life. You have to still, you know, chase your dreams and, and do all the things that you would have done anyway. You just kind of sometimes have to adapt that plan a little bit. Recently, I think it was about a year ago, the foundation launched something called the human collective project. Mm. Um, I was wondering if you could explain for our listeners what that is and what, what was the inspiration behind it? Oh yeah. It's so special. I think it's actually one of the the programs I'm most proud about. So unless you're living under a rock, you know that in 2020, we were all in lockdown, especially us immunocompromised patients who were, you know, uh, more at risk to COVID than the average Joe. So we were definitely very stuck at home. And I could tell just from the conversations that I was observing on our Facebook groups, and even amongst our ambassadors, that people were so they were craving connectivity on another level because of all of the chaos that was going on around us. And I said to myself, you know, I chat with a few NMO ladies infrequently, but like when we do once every couple of weeks or so, it's like five of us and it's great. And we all feel so much better after that. Why not just make this a thing? I love that you're, you're inspired by like, you see a need, you fill the gap, you know, like that the community is driving the programs that your foundation is, is providing. Yeah. And I think that's important, right, Lelinia, because ultimately it's the patients who are at the core of all of this, right? The doctors are of course important, you know, pharmaceutical companies, everybody plays a very big role. But I think what has really helped TSF sort of 
gain its reputation, I hope it's a good one, I'm assuming it is, uh, is that I'm a patient myself. So I, you know, have these experiences, and I understand maybe on a different level than somebody who's not a patient. But like you just said, you know, I try to look at what is the community asking for? What do they not have? What are gaps that we can fill? Because that's how we can tackle things head on. And I want to, I have always tried to lead this foundation with patients first and looking from the patient's perspective and, you know, patients kind of drive the rest of whatever happens. Yeah. That, that whole thing around patient centered care, it's become a buzzword in the medical community. I would say probably in the last 10 to 12 years, I've heard it a lot and annoyingly. So my dad, it's, it's a thing of, you know, what does that actually mean? Like when you, when you distill that, what, what, what is the actionable thing around that? Right. And so it's really beautiful to see that, like, you know, because you're a patient, you're, you're actually doing something really, really meaningful. And it's not just a buzzword that you attach to things that, you know, the, the foundation is very patient centered and it's reactive to the needs of the community. And I think that that's, that's an important distinction, you know? Yeah. And I agree with you that um, patient centricity has become the buzzword of the last couple of years. I see it everywhere I go. And speaking of that, you know, the Samira Foundation recently expanded into Canada. What role will the foundation play in supporting patients here? Oh, what a great question. I'm so glad you asked. I want to preface this answer by saying that I, I don't know how many people know this about me, but I my are from Bangladesh and Myanmar, actually, and they immigrated to the U.S., 40 years ago. So I'm second generation Bengali and Burmese. I identify as a Muslim. I am a woman. So all this to say that I am a, I am a minority almost on every front and handicap. So you add that to the mix. And I'm telling you this because one thing that really dawned on me about 18 months ago was when I realized that, wow, TSF has sort of taken this life of its own here in the, and I'm so happy that it did. I could have imagined that it would be what it has become, but I'm so, I'm so happy that, you know, we can lend this support. We can empower patients. We can embolden them. We can help them get access to therapies, get better, quicker diagnosis, diagnoses, get access to testing, connect them with the right doctors, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And because of my background and my family, I had this moment of clarity where I said, this is great. And I'm glad this is happening here. But what about the rest of the world? And like, you know, I imagined, what if my parents didn't immigrate here? And I was born in, you know, a a developing part of the world with NMO, what would have happened to me, I would have probably died, or I probably wouldn't have gotten access to therapy, I wouldn't have gotten diagnosed properly, I may have been in a much worse situation than I'm in now. So it was that realization that was sort of the impetus for our international expansion. I said to my team, I said, guys, I don't care how we do it. But one thing is for sure is that we need to bring whatever we've done here successfully to the rest of the world, because I feel I'm doing a disservice by not doing that for the patients of the world. There are NMO patients on every corner of this planet that so many of them are living with this disease in silence, in darkness, without support, without therapies, without right you know, the right doctors treating them. So Canada is really symbolic because it's the first of our international expansion. And Canada, I chose Canada because I'm not gonna lie, I'm obsessed with Canada. We're the cool neighbor of the North, right? You're definitely <laughs> the cool neighbor of the North. And, you know, I said, this is the first time we're doing this. So I think doing it with a friendly neighbor would be great. We'll learn a lot as we go. And, you know, of course, you guys are an English speaking country, which helps for the most part. So, yeah, I, 
I chose Canada. And the short answer is my goal is to replicate virtually everything we have done and continue to do and bring it to as many places as possible. I want to be on every continent, Melania. I want to make sure that every patient feels supported and that they have us to lean on because as a patient leader, that's really important to me. And the first thing that we're doing in addition to launching Canada and now Germany is we are actually translating every piece of content that we have ever, ever, ever produced, whether it is prose or something on our web, on our website, webinars, podcasts, resources, you name it, we're translating them at first, the 10 most commonly spoken languages in the world. And I think that is going to be a really great way to extend, you know, our foundation to those who speak those languages around the world. But Canada is really special. I'm very excited to finally come and do the work there. And, you know, through this podcast, I'd like to say to, I am committed to Canadian Canadian NMO patients that we're going to do everything that we've done here and more, and we're going to learn a lot from each other. That's great that you're saying you're translating everything because of course we have two official languages. We speak French here as well, and we can't leave out our Francophone friends and and patients. So it's great to know that all of those resources will be translated for them and, and available in their language, which is so important. I mean, you know, when you talk about access, that's one point of access that we can definitely use in this country. So that's, that's amazing. And maybe you want to just um, tell our listeners a little bit about Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer. Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 of course. So we started talking about developing and launching TSF Canada, we put out a call for applications and Jennifer actually ended up being one of them. And um, we had some lovely candidates, but, and she was of course, very qualified. She's a, a very hardworking woman, so much experience. And what really set her apart, of course, was the fact that she was a patient. I said, if we're a patient centered organization, and our primary customers are patients. Let's put patients in leadership because our lives don't have to be over with this. Let's try to reimagine our lives, our careers with NMO. We can do it. And so I'm so happy that our first international executive director is a patient who started as an ambassador. And not going to lie, I love that she's a woman. Yeah, it's really great. I was really excited to hear that she was chosen for the position. And I think it's really important that, um, you know, the person that's overseeing how things for, for the foundation are being done in other countries is a person from that country, because, mm -hmm. you know, there's nuances to how things are done. I mean, you know, like, for example, between Canada and the U.S., the medical system completely different. We don't deal with a lot of insurance issues. I mean, we have extended medical, you know, some of us have private plans for things that aren't covered by our, our government plan, but, you know, by and large, Canadians don't see bills for things, you know, when they go to go and have steroids, for example. So, I mean, just having somebody that knows the players and, you know, what's happening in that country and the issues that are specific to Canada is really powerful. And I think, you know, that's going to be a huge strength of having her in that position and being able to know the intricacies of all of that, because you can't expect yourself to know, like, what's yeah. going on in another country, you know, to the degree that somebody who lives it every day does. So um, I think that's a really wise choice to, to, you know, have somebody in that position that that is an actual resident of that country and understands it very clearly. And and also that they're a patient. So yeah, yeah, all I it was so important to us. I mean, I, 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 I don't know Canada like you guys. I only go for vacation and there's still so many parts of your country I have yet to visit. So, um, you know, I didn't want to be foolish in thinking that I, I could do this from here remotely in another country. Could I oversee it? Of course. But I, I, I know how important it is to have 
people on the ground in the country who are from there, who speak the language, who understand the culture, and like you said, the nuances and the people much better than I do. And so that's our goal, really, when we go abroad, too, identifying these patient champions who are open to leadership positions that can um, lead the TSF movement and mission in their um, local regions. Mm -hmm. Well, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to, you know, share your experience and talk about the future of the foundation in Canada. And I'm just really appreciative of your time and your energy. And, you know, it's, it's been so great chatting with you. I have one final question I wanted to ask you, and that is, if you could travel back in time to when you were first diagnosed, what would you want current Samira to tell newly diagnosed Samira? Oh, that's a good question, <laughs> Lelena. Oh, gosh. Um, I think I would tell myself that it's going to be okay. Stay yeah. positive. Cry if you need to. I think crying is great. I cried a lot. But, you know, being scared is normal with so much uncertainty. But I wish... I could go back and tell myself that just keep your chin up, keep doing what you're doing. It's going to be okay. Because I was obviously just like a nervous wreck for like every day for 18 months. And, you know, I think it could have pacified some of my anxiety. I, I don't feel any kind of shame for having felt those things. They were very real. And I didn't have the luxury of having this voice in my head. But if I did, I would go back and say, girl, it's going to be okay. And actually, there's something really beautiful that's going to come out of all of this. I love it. I mean, you know, it's, it definitely having this diagnosis changes your life. But I think in the beginning, you think about how it's going to change your life in a negative way, because, you know, most of us, our attacks are so scary and quick and devastating. And when you're so young and you've had that experience, but I think, you know, age really doesn't matter. It's scary no matter what age you are you know, just thinking about you're going to have some beautiful things come from that and just being able, to, like, if you only had the knowledge of that at the time, right? If you could only tell yourself, like, ultimately, it will be okay. Yeah. And I think another thing, this is kind of deep, but I would tell myself that even though you are losing and have lost so much vision, you're going to see so much more in terms of life and people and experiences. Like my purview is just expanded so much despite vision loss. I see so much more. And I know that now. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, and I think that that's a great place to leave this at, you know, for our listeners to know that you can be this person, you can be scared. That is perfectly normal but things will change and your perspective will change and you will grow and you will move forward. And you do that with community. You don't do that by yourself. And you've been a big part of that, Lelaine. Yeah. Meeting you is, uh, has been such a joy. I learned so much from you and this has been so wonderful. Thank you. You're a great podcast uh, host. <laughs> I like it. Thank you. I'll take that compliment. <laughs> Thank you for being my first guest. Absolutely, my honor. We hope you have enjoyed listening to this NMOSD Your Way Global podcast. For more information about NMOSD and access to support and resources, please read the podcast description. What you have heard in this podcast may not be reflective of your own experience and does not replace the advice of a healthcare professional. If you have any concerns or specific questions about NMOSD, please speak to your physician.